if you buy an NFT, you own, you have the certificate of ownership of authenticity of that NFT. And people can copy paste it a thousand times, just like I can print a thousand Mona Lisa's and I don't own the NFT. And actually copy pasting the NFT and spreading the word about NFT is actually going to help with the value of that NFT. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the latest episode of the Hashkey Learn video series, where we speak to experts and professionals in the crypto industry to understand the most pressing and important subjects in the world of digital assets. Now, today I am joined by an old friend of the show and my colleague, uh, Henry Santiero, who is Senior Research Manager at Hashkey Capital. Now, today we are going to talk everything about NFTs. Now we've heard, now you've heard the word NFTs for, for quite a while. I think towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year, we've really seen the NFT frenzy reach its zenith. Uh, but ever since, you know, um, probably around April and, and May, we've kind of seen the NFT craze die down a little bit, but you know, it's still one of the most talked about subjects in crypto. Now, uh, Henry, you, I know you are an expert in NFT. Now, can you first break down or explain to us, you know, what gives an NFT value, actually. Yeah, Jason, first, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk with you about the coolest technology in the world, crypto, NFTs, and blockchain. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so what gives an NFT value? I would say that what gives the NFT value is whatever is associated to the NFT. Mm. So NFTs are basically uh, certificates of authenticity of something, yeah. right? You know, NFTs are, in fact, they exist for hundreds of years, but um, 250 years ago, Vincent van Gogh would have a paper certificate of authenticity yeah. and not a digital one. And now for the first time in human history, we can have digital certificates of authenticity that are in a form of NFT. And why do some NFTs have so much value, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some NFTs, just like traditional paintings, are Veblen goods. And what does it mean? A Veblen good is a good that has more demand, the higher the price is. And art works pretty much like this, right? If you have a, a painting that is sold for $5,000, no one talks about it. If it is sold for $50,000, some people talk about it. But if the painting is sold for $500,000, everybody talks about it and everyone wants it, right? And in some aspects, NFTs, just like any other representation of art, are Veblen goods. And uh, the more, the higher the value of those goods, uh, the higher the demand. And that's why some NFTs get so expensive. We saw the record-breaking Beeple NFT selling for $69 million. Yeah, that was wild, yeah. <laughs> that was really wild. And I think that was kind of like the start of the whole NFT craze, was it, right? Yeah, exactly, because the... Uh, the people start to see the kaching, all the money flowing, yeah. and digital artists that have been living paycheck to paycheck, finally they could make some meaningful money, right? And this is much more fair for digital artists and traditional artists when it comes like to royalties and things like that. Now, one thing you mentioned that was interesting, which gives NFT a value, is the artist behind it or the effort that was put in towards the creation of the work. But I think what's what's worth mentioning is that when you look at the likes of uh board a yacht club you know newton eight yacht club or the board a canal club these and these blue chip nfts right the the team behind the creation of it you know there aren't famous artists right there aren't like celebrities or uh very distinguished people in the space but mm -hmm. so what actually consigns value towards these nft collections that aren't created by famous artists right right Okay, that's a great question. Mm. I think in part is the memification. The memification, okay. Yeah, of, of these artworks. Yeah. And that's also in part why some traditional artworks uh, get so well known. Mona Lisa was not well known like for 400 years, right? Mm -hmm. And then around like 100 years ago, because Mona Lisa was stolen from the museum, everyone started to talk about the Mona Lisa. And everyone, already 100 years ago, started to do memes about the Mona Lisa, right? Mm -hmm. Started to, to, yep. 
to do copies, to do variations of the work. And then Mona Lisa got like spread worldwide as a very well-known um, piece of art. And that's why it got so much value. Mm -hmm. Now, like uh, the Yuga Labs uh, universe, like U Yugaverse, right, of uh, NFTs, like Board Ape, Kennel Club, Mutant Ape, and, all, and so on, they, they, they are very well known also, right? They, they are like memes of, um, of the digital world that we have nowadays. And they have a huge marketing machine behind the scenes, right? You have people like Justin Bieber, Snoop Dogg, Steve Aoki, Mark Cuban, Eminem. Uh, Eminem, yeah. yeah. Right. All these celebrities, Serena Williams, all these celebrities were on a board day. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge marketing machine, contributes to the, the memification of these NFTs. And that's in part why they are so, so successful. And I think another reason that gives these NFT value is the status and the social flex, right? Because there are a limited number of BAYCs out there. So you holding one means that you're in a very special club, right? You're in a very exclusive um, member of, of, of like a very um, rare collection of NFTs. Yeah. Now, what you mentioned just now is the topic of ex exclusivity, right? Mm -hmm. If you own a BAYC, you're in a very exclusive club of a very limited number of people who owns this NFT. But but here's the dilemma, like how can projects or how do NFT projects strike a balance between exclusivity and accessibility? So mm. the reason I asked this is because um, the idea of crypto, like the, one of the core notions, one of the core principles of crypto is that it is aimed to be something that is, can be accessible, that, that, that can be accessible by, you know, by, by everyone, right? Even mm -hmm. the most commoner can also participate in the world of digital assets. Um, unlike, you know, what is it in the traditional finance space, right? But when you look at projects, blue chip projects like BAYC, right, you have to be very rich in order to own one. And I think at the time of this recording, the floor price of BAYC is around 66 ETH, which kind of, which it did drop massively, but it's still very expensive. So how can projects balance between exclusivity and accessibility in order for people to really participate in their projects? Yeah, great question. Um, because projects, they, they benefit from the exclusivity because more exclusivity means higher floor prices mm. and uh, more attractive prices also mean generating more revenue, uh, more, more royalties for, yeah. for the projects. But yeah, I think I'll say like, it, it's very hard to balance that. Probably even like impossible. Um, maybe we can see the, this kind of inclusivity more in the gaming space. In the gaming space, um, people have been for last 20 years, you buy digital items inside certain games mm. and people spend throughout the years, millions and millions of dollars buying digital items inside games, but they don't really own anything, right? And now that we are moving to the metaverse and uh, metaverse is going to give us a more inclusive uh, um, and immersive experience, blending our real lives with the digital world, we want to have more ownership of our stuff that we have in the uh, in the online world, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't want just to buy a spaceship and the spaceship actually is owned by the game developer, EVE Online, for example, and they're actually just leasing the spaceship to you. You actually want to own it and bring it to uh, wherever you, you, you are playing. So in this aspect, it's much more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And maybe the gaming space is just the first example of many other examples that we can have in the future. And pretty much any uh, asset can be represented by an NFT. So I think it's it's going to be like very inclusive in the future. Now, Henry, you just mentioned uh, the gaming space. And I think the gaming space and the digital art space, they are currently the two main utilities when it comes to NFT applications. Now, what are some other areas or some other sectors where you think NFT can also play a role in terms of its um, applications and use cases? Mm. Yeah, there are many different areas where, where uh, NFTs are really revolutionizing and bringing so much value. Um, but the first two that came to my mind is the fashion industry and music. And let's start with the fashion industry. And nowadays, brands are creating NFTs that, for example, that uh, people can buy these NFT t-shirts mm. 
and wear their digital avatar with these t-shirts. And at the same time, you receive the physical t-shirts. Or Nike, uh, Nike is also doing this. You can buy this pair of sneakers, you buy the physical ones and you receive an NFT with the digital version of the sneakers and your digital avatar can wear the same that you wear. We had a few months ago on the Centerland, the, um, the digital fashion week, which had over a hundred thousand attendees. Mm -hmm. I think a hundred thousand people is more than the, the physical Paris fashion week, right? And people were able to buy digital fashion. You had brands like Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Dolce Gabbana, uh, Forever 21, tons of brands participating in a digital fashion week and selling digital clothes as NFTs. Sometimes they come with, with a physical item or not. So fashion is a big one. I think the second one is music industry, mm -hmm. right? Musicians have been really underpaid. Yeah. If you put your, your music in platforms like Spotify, you get like 0 0.001 cents per stream. And some artists discover that they can leverage their, uh, their, their fan base and actually just issue an NFT with those musics. Like Snoop Dogg, for example, he removed a ton of songs that he has on Spotify and uh, sold them as NFTs. And he made in one day more than he will do in 10 years of Spotify. Yeah. Other musicians are doing this. Uh, Mike Shinoda, Blau, uh, Steve Aoki. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's quite cool to see how is it changing uh, the music industry. And what happens with NFTs is that both musical artists, physical uh, paint, uh, paintings and everything, what they can do is that these NFTs can provide you royalties that pay any time there is a secondary market sale if someone resells my music I'm, or I'm tired of Kings of Leon, I'm going to sell this album to someone else. I will sell it to you for mm -hmm. one ETH and Kings of Leon are going to automatically get a percentage in royalties that are paid via the smart contract that created um, the, those NFTs. So everything is automated and it's very cool because you really guarantee that these artists are going to receive their royalties. Now, uh, before we conclude our discussion, let's talk about misconceptions, right? With these mm -hmm. HashKeyLearn episodes, you know, I love to always talk about misconceptions of specific uh, crypto subtopics because crypto is such a nascent industry. So there's there tends to be lots of misinformation that, that flows around. Now, uh, we have a couple to go through, but um, I'm just going to select a few. That's pretty interesting. Now, the first one we can talk about is it is very easy to make money by investing and flipping in NFTs. The reason some people might say that is because I think it, at the beginning of this year, 2022, we've seen you know many people um you know making millions by just uh buying and reselling the huge blue chip nfts or if it's just even a very popular nft collection um how true is this statement yeah um for the last one two years people have been doing a lot of money flipping nfts yeah. because there was so much hype in in the nft market but this couldn't continue of course it's not sustainable if i want to sell one bitcoin or uh, one Apple share, I go to the market and I sell it in, in a few seconds, right? It's a very liquid market. NFTs, just like uh, the art market, is not very liquid. If I want to sell an NFT, if I want to sell it now, probably I need to lower my price. Yeah. Uh, the second myth or misconception that, you know, I think it's pretty interesting is that some people think uh, by kind of copying and pasting an NFT means that I but copy and pasting that image or that JPEG means that I actually own the NFT, but that is incorrect, right? Can you can you debunk that for us? Yeah, it's incorrect and it's even like silly to think that way. Uh -huh. In the past, there was already very skilled painters mm -hmm. that made copies of the Mona Lisa and they look exactly the same as the Mona Lisa. Does it mean that if you buy a Mona Lisa copy, you own the Mona Lisa? No, yeah. you own a copy and the original is the original. In the same way, with NFTs and any uh, rare assets, right? If you buy an NFT, you own, you have the certificate of ownership of authenticity of that NFT, and people can copy paste it a thousand times, just like I can print a thousand Mona Lisa's and I don't own the NFT. 
And actually, copy pasting the NFT and spreading the word about the NFT is actually going to help with the value of that NFT. It's going to help with the mimification of that NFT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, well, bottom line, NFTs are not JPEG images, uh, if you're still wondering out there. Um, well, I appreciate today's uh, conversation, Henry. I think it's been really fun discussing with you. Well, first of all, thank you uh, again for coming on the show. It's um, a pleasure. Yes. Yeah, so, um, well, guys, stay tuned for other episodes, um, which will be discussing many other topics, including the metaverse, uh, how venture capital works in the world of crypto and others. So uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. See you next time. Awesome. Thanks, man. Awesome. Appreciate it.